Welcome, and in this video, we're going to be reading Matthew chapter 24. Now, this is a very exciting chapter. This is the chapter that's talking about the second coming of the Messiah, talking about the end of the world, talking about the rapture, lots of things, talking about future events. What is this world coming to? This is what Jesus says. Let's start out with verse 1. Jesus went out from the temple and was going on his way. His disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all of these, don't you? Most certainly, I tell you, there will not be left here one stone on another that will not be thrown down. Now, let me stop here for a second. There are some people that believe that what Jesus is talking about here is the destruction of the temple that happened in 70 A.D. However, the destruction of the temple that happened in 70 A.D. did not fully fulfill what Jesus said here. It didn't. We still have part of the temple standing. We, I mean, it, this, the, the temple that we have now, the, the ruins of the temple, I should say, we can't say that there is not left one stone on another. Okay. So yes, the destruction, the destruction of the temple that happened in 70 AD destroyed most of the temple, but it did not fulfill what happened here. Now, I know a lot of people, you know, some people uh, would say that, you know, all this was fulfilled in 70 AD. These people are called the preterists. They believe that Jesus came back already. They believe that Jesus uh, in his millennial reign, his thousand year reign, as spoken of in the, in the book of Revelation, is already has already happened or is happening, which again, it does not fit the profile. In many places you, you, you see in the book of Revelation and also in context in this here, you talk about, uh, you know, every stone, you know, here uh, it, it says not one stone will be laid upon or will be left upon another. In Revelation, talks about the whole world. He causes all, you know, to worship the beast. You know, um, and we just don't have that fulfilled in history. Certainly, you can take little pockets here and there and say, yeah, you know, there was this community or this city or this country maybe that a certain leader caused to worship, uh, you know, an image or, or or so on and so forth. You know, the mark of the beast. There's all this kind of stuff that, Predators believe already happened based upon just finite localities and not really taking the scriptures literally for what it literally really says. Okay, here Jesus said that not one stone will be left upon another. Okay, so he's talking about total destruction, total annihilation. Okay, verse three. As he, saw, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, okay, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Okay, so there's this term, the end of the age, which again, some people believe this already happened in 70 AD. We are still living in, uh, we don't, <laughs> we haven't come to the end of the age yet, according to the scriptures. Now I'm going to go into a little bit, you know, a lot more detail of this as we read through the scriptures. But yes, Jesus did not come back uh, yet. He did not come back to set up his rule and reign, you know, in Jerusalem as, as prophesied in Isaiah, in Micah. Uh, as he prophesied here, it did not happen yet. And I know that some people say, well, it, you know, it, it's happened in the spiritual realm. Again, you know, <laughs> you can take one prophecy and try to make it fit by saying, well, if it doesn't happen, fit, you know, in, the, in real reality, it happens somehow in some way in some application of the spiritual. No, uh, we're going to talk about that again a, a, a little bit later here as well. But let's see. The disciples said, when will these things be? When will the temple be destroyed? So much so uh, that not one stone will be left upon another, which, again, hasn't happened yet. Now, we think, again, you got to take it in, in context and look at it, what it really says. Verse 1, it does say the buildings of the temple, okay? Not just one not just the temple per se, but the buildings of the temple. Um, 
so, yeah. So when will these things be? Question number one. When will it be that not one stone will be left upon it? When will everything be laid waste, destroyed? Okay, because they knew from ancient prophets, from the ancient prophecies, you know, some of which we have in what they call the Old Testament, uh, they knew that it, that it spoke of total, utter destruction, okay, where everything would be laid waste. Everything. Everything would be laid waste, okay? Um, so number one, tell us when these things will be. Number two, what is the sign of your coming? And number three, the end of the age. And this is a question that, you know, pretty much, I would say almost everybody has this question one time or another in their life. You know, when is the world ever going to end? You know, is there, is this age ever going to, is there going to be uh, an end to the world as we know it? Is there going to be, you know, when's the end of the age? Um what will happen? What has to happen before then? What is this world coming to? Good questions for Jesus. Verse 4, Jesus answered them. Now, look at this. First thing he said, the first thing he said, okay? Be careful that no one leads you astray. Okay, you need to, you need to highlight this in your Bible if you don't have it. Underline it. Whatever you need to do because this is the first thing he said. This is the... <laughs> this is his first words about the whole thing about the end of the world. Be careful that no one leads you astray. Why would he say that first? This is a primary concern. This is a primary uh, problem uh, when it comes to the latter days, the end, the last days. A primary problem that there will be a lot of people not telling you the truth. So what you got to do is... Okay, let me let me just interject this here as well because you know we're talking about scripture, we're reading scripture. Let's take scripture and compare it with scripture. You know, I, Acts chapter seventeen talks about the men of Berea when Paul and his uh, and and his fellows, his his work, his partners went to Berea to preach the good news of 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 Jesus, and the men of Berea it says they were honorable men, they were noble men. Never said anything bad about them. It says what they did was w the message that Paul preached, the gospel according to Paul, they did not believe that. They didn't believe anything that Paul said until they first searched it out in the scriptures to see if it was true. Well, again, you got to think. Use your brains here a little bit. What scriptures did they have back then? They didn't have the New Testament. They didn't have the Bible as we have it today. They had the Septuagint. They had, we know the Book of Enoch existed back then. Back then, We know other books like that. The Book of Jubilees existed back then. I mean, we got the, the, the books that were in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We know, we know that they were in circulation back then. They searched the scriptures. They searched the scriptures, the Tanakh. They searched the scriptures to see whether or not what Paul said was true. Okay? Now, I know some of you, especially the ultra-conservative evangelical Christians right now, you, I might be losing you a little bit here. Now, hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay? I know exactly where you are. I know exactly what you're thinking. But, hey, we have to... you got to look at it for what it really is. You got to look at, you know, back in those days, you got to look at it and say, hey, what did they have back then for scriptures? They didn't have the King James Version. They didn't have the Bible as we have it today. They had the Septuagint, we know that, which included a lot of the, actually included a lot of the Apocrypha and, you know, more than the Roman Catholic Bibles have today, by the way. Uh, so they had the Septuagint. They had other books that they uh, that they that was in circulation, and we know this by circumstantial evidence and also by archaeological ev evidence as well by the Dead Sea Scrolls and such as well. So, how can you be careful that no one leads you astray? This is the, this is the key. You got to be like the men in Berea. In Acts chapter 17, you have to know the scriptures, okay? First of all, know the scriptures. 
what I'm talking about by the scriptures, know the scriptures that they knew. Most churches today that I know of, they like to think of themselves or they at least at least their goal is to be the biblical church the church like in the church of the book of acts you know almost every church well i can say a lot of churches anyway that i know 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 of they they purport to be book of acts type material book of acts did not have paul's letters to preach from book of acts did not have any of the you know, books that we have from Matthew to Revelation to preach from. What did they preach their sermons based on? What text did they use? What scriptures did they have? What did they base all of their faith on? What did they base their faith of Jesus on? Was the scriptures that they had previous. That was, in, that was, that was, th these scriptures were in existence previous to the coming of Christ. Think about it. Think about it now, okay? So, likewise, if you want to be like the Book of Acts church, you have to know the scriptures, the BC scriptures, okay? The before Christ scriptures. You got to know them inside and out. And I know that's a big, big statement because today, for example, even the one little portion of scriptures, like the the, the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch or the uh, Torah, as the, the, the Jewish people, you know, like to call it. There are a lot of people in the Jewish world that they give their entire life. They use all of their time in their life just to study the Torah. And even then, they never claim to come to the full revelation of it or the full knowledge of it or to really, really understand it to, to the fullest because they spend their entire life just studying that alone, okay? So when I say you need to know the scriptures, BC, that's a, I know that's a big thing to say, but you need to do that in order to really look at it from the biblical New Testament perspective. Be careful that no one leads you astray. You have to know the scriptures. Jesus, uh, I met a couple people. Um, I, met, I met someone there uh, several months ago who actually told me that it was evil. All knowledge is evil. He, he didn't want to know anything uh, except for he followed this one preacher. Um, and he didn't want to know. Actually, let me let me say this because a lot of you need to need to hear this. Uh, this guy followed a, a man by the name of William Branham, okay, and he considered Branham to be basically the be all end all of all prophets and, and everything else. So he didn't want to know anything about church history, Bible history, anything, any any kind of thing at all apart from what Branham teaches, and that's very cultic. That's very wrong, okay? Uh, as I heard one uh, judge say before, um, uh, you have to come with an open mind, but don't come with an empty mind, okay? That's what the men of Berea had, the men of Berea in, in Acts chapter 17. They had an open mind. They were willing to listen to what Paul had to say, but they didn't have an empty mind. They had the scriptures in their mind. They stuck, they they relate, they went back to the scriptures. And again, what, what is the scriptures? The Tanakh and other ancient documents as well. Previous, that was written previous to the coming of Jesus, not New Testament scriptures. Okay. So, yes, in order to really be careful that no one leads you to leads you astray, you need to know the scriptures. You need to know. The scriptures very well. Okay, that should be a priority in every one of in in every one of our lives. Get to know the scriptures, read the Torah, read the Nevi'im, the prophets, read the Ketuvim, the writings. Get to know the, the 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 scriptures previous to the coming of Messiah, so that you know the context of 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 what Jesus is talking about here, and the context of the Book of Acts. And the context of the first first century church, okay? Again, I know a lot of people. You know, I've attended churches where they prom, prom, you know promote and they are proud of saying we we are a you know we are a Book of Acts church. But now to look back at it, like they say, uh, hindsight is twenty twenty. They weren't a Book of Acts church. 
because they didn't have the Tanakh and the other writings, the scriptures, uh, as their foundation. They had other things as their foundation. Be careful that no one leads you astray. Know your scriptures. Know it, understand it. Know its interpretation. Know how to apply it. Know what it means. Study. Do your studies. Don't, don't trust anything. You know, don't trust any big name evangelist to tell you what the Bible actually says. You get in, you read it. You read it. And pray for understanding. And more, most importantly, do it. Don't just read it. Do it. Okay? Verse 5. The words in red. For many will come in my name. Uh, my name? The name of Jesus? Saying, I am the Christ. The word Christ here is Christos, which also means anointed. Okay? I am the anointed one, or I am an anointed one. Okay? There are people today, preachers today, that, that really promote themselves as being anointed. But are they really, or is it just something else going on? Okay? Okay? Again, know your scriptures. Don't just know it up here. Know it, love it, and do it. Okay? And will lead many astray. Okay? So this is the problem today. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of preachers on TV, preachers on the radio at your local church. And a lot of people go to their local church, listen to the pastor, listen to the bishop, listen to the priest, listen to the people on TV, read these books, and they trust them to tell, instead of reading the Bible, that's what they read. Instead of spending their time reading the Bible, they spend their time listening to a lot of nonsense, you know, for lack of better words. On TV, on radio, on the internet. Not that it's all bad. I'm not saying that it's 100% bad, but... You know, find that 0.1%, okay? Find that 1%, that's good. Do your studies, do your homework. Verse 6, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you aren't troubled, for all this must happen. But the end, again, Jesus is talking about the end here. Highlighted the end. The end is not yet. So Jesus is talking about the end. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. We've heard about it through the millennia. Even in the past hundred years, we've had, you know, the world wars. Hundred and some odd years. We've had the, the world wars. And we've had many other different wars, civil wars, and all kinds of different wars. So you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you aren't troubled, for all this must happen. Must happen. So it is in the, it's on the schedule, okay? Verse 7, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines. We've seen, we've seen a lot of that even in the past, you know, 100, 150 years. Famines, plagues, we've seen a lot of that. Ebola, AIDS, SARS, and lots of other stuff going on, okay? That's just to name a few. And earthquakes. Oh, yeah, yeah. We've seen that too in various places. But all these are the beginning of birth pains. Now, for those of you who know what birth pains, birth pains begin, uh, you know, less for in, they begin, and then, they, you know, the pain comes and goes away. And then a little while, pain comes again, goes away. The more time goes on, the more frequent the birth pains are and uh, the more intense they are. And so, generally speaking, generally speaking, over the, over the course of hundreds of years, if you look at it, how many earthquakes and famines and plagues there are, they are, generally speaking, getting more frequent and more intense. I know that there's been times that there has been very bad plagues and 
in that. But I'm, again, I'm talking about generally speaking. I'm talking about the number of plagues, the number of people that died, and, and so on and so forth. Um, the number of alarms that the world has had. Verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to the to oppression and will kill you. Okay? Now in the book of John, it says that the, that pe- it w- the day will come when people will kill you and think they're doing service for God. Okay? And yes, yes, that's true. Even today, there are people... Christians, uh, people who believe in Jesus, who are getting killed, as I'm speaking, by other people who believe they're doing a service to God. You know, you can put that in also the context of the service to Allah, because Allah means God as well. Um, But some people believe that that is God's will, or that is Allah's will, and they kill other people because of that. That's what they believe. Yeah, some people believe that. Jesus said they will oppress you and kill you. You will be hated. Not you'll be loved because, oh, you're just a bunch of love, love, lovely people who preach love and, you know, hug the trees and everything. You, you will be hated by all nations, all nations, for my name's sake. Hmm. All nations. That's quite the statement. Verse 10. Then many will stumble. Stumble here again. Whenever you hear Jesus talking about stumbling, almost always, if not always, speaking about sin. So many will stumble. They will sin. They will fall into sin. They will fall into um, wrongdoing. Okay? And will deliver up one another and will hate one another one another. So they will betray one another. They will report one another to the government. They will report one another to the authorities. They will hate one another. Verse 11, many false prophets will arise and will lead many astray, which we've seen many times. Okay. How many people in how many different religions claim to be a prophet including leaders of certain religions, claim to be a true prophet when they're not. Flat out, not. False prophets. Many false prophets will arise. Okay, so there there are Christians who like to point at people on TV or point at your local charismatic church or whatever it is and say and, and, and use the term false prophet very flippantly and just very commonly. And that's fine to a certain degree because, you know, a lot of these people are false prophets and they need to be known as false because they are false. Say, oh, I, the Lord spoke to me. Not that God doesn't speak anymore today, but... Certainly not as often as people uh, actually claim. But I don't think God is so concerned about Pastor John being a false prophet as he is about other so-called prophets who have come and led billions of people into deception. Billions. And stupid, duped politicians fall for it. False prophets will arise and lead many astray. I don't think it's just talking about thousands here. Not, maybe not even millions. I'm th- I think it's talking about billions. Verse 12. Because iniquity will be multiplied. Iniquity, sin, iniquity, anomia, uh, th- the act of not going by Torah. An- a meaning negative, no, not nomia from nomos meaning law or Torah, because Torahlessness, lawlessness, the the law of God, uh, is 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 basically preached against, thrown out, because iniquity iniquity will be multiplied. The love of many will grow cold. Okay, so in order to have true love, you have to have true law. Law and love do, do not go um, against one another. You know, laws, true good laws are, are in place because of true and good love. Because if you love 
you really have that law to 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 uh, to follow. Uh, wherever there's no law, there's no love. As as the scriptures say, love against you know true love. There is no law against true love. Uh, the question is, what is true love? Because everybody's got their own definition of love anymore these days. Verse thirteen. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Who will be saved? Everybody who says the sinner's prayer and everybody who says, oh, I trust in the grace of God. I trust in the faith of God. I believe in God. I pray every day. I ever go to church every weekend. No. That's not what Jesus said. Who will be saved? Those who just call upon the name of the Lord. Well, again, people who take you know, passages like Romans 10 verse 9 saying, you know, the, everybody who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Or everybody who calls upon the name of the Lord and, you know, and, and, and believes in their heart that Jesus rose from, from, from the dead, uh, Jesus rose from the dead, will be saved. That's a general statement, okay? That is not the be-all, end-all of how to get saved, okay? Again, let me put it this way. You can say to somebody, where's Hawaii? You want to get to Hawaii? It's that way. Hawaii's that way. Go that way. Well, obviously, it takes a whole lot more than just going that way. Okay, you got to go on a you got to purchase your ticket. You know, you've got to go on a plane, or, or you know, I don't know how many people go on a boat anymore, but you know what I mean. It takes a whole lot more than just going that way. It takes a whole lot more work than just going. Hang a left over here, bud. You know, so just saying, just believing in Jesus is all you got to do. Do you know what it really means to believe in a Jewish rabbi? Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. Go ask a practicing Orthodox Jew what it means for him to believe in his rabbi. It means to do all the commandments. It means to hang on his every word. It means obedience. It means doing. Believing means doing. Not just a mental thing. Jesus made that very clear in Matthew chapter 25. And we're going to get to that next, the next uh, session. It's going to be awesome. Matthew chapter 25 is awesome when it comes to uh, uh, Jesus making it very clear what the day of judgment is going to be like for the one going to heaven and for the one going to hell. For the good and the bad. For everybody, he makes it very clear. But we'll get to that uh, next time. We'll get, that, we'll get to that in the next teaching. Verse 13, though, but he who endures to the end will be saved. There is a condition here. How do you get saved? You have to endure to the end. What does that mean? Why do you say you have to endure, endure, endure? Because there is, as Jesus said, there'd be a lot of oppression. There's a lot of hardship. People get, want to kill you. You got to endure through the hardship. You can't just stand your comforting, you know, my little comfort zone, my little, I feel comfortable here, I feel peaceful here. Forget it! Verse 14, this good news, or this gospel, gospel means good news, of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world for a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Then the end will come. God is waiting for the good news, the gospel, to be preached in the whole world. Trust me, there are some nations out there that are very hostile to the gospel. But it has to be penetrated. The good news of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world for a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. You say such and such a country is opening up now. Another country is opening up now. Well, you know, that's a sign. Once they allow the once the gospel can come in and the good news can be preached, God's word, God's commandments, God's ways can be preached in that nation, the end will come. Verse 15, when, therefore, you see the abomination of desolation. Now, that's in um, Daniel 9, 27, 11, 31, and 12, 
11. Okay. When you see the abomination, abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through the prophet, through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Now, I believe that the abomination of desolation, it would be when the son of perdition, they call it, the scriptures call it the son of perdition, the most evil man in the world that the whole world will love and worship. The son of perdition, they call, other people call him the Antichrist. When the Antichrist or the false prophet will come into the rebuilt temple. So the temple of God, the temple has to be rebuilt. When that particular evil man will come in to the temple, standing in the holy place. Okay, before the presence of God, God's wrath is going to lash out like never before. Okay, and once again, to all the preterists out there, for those of you who will encounter pre preterists, which is probably quite a few of you, um, you can't say that there was a there was a son of perdition or an antichrist that the whole world worshipped back then, you know, seventy A.D. or whatever that came into the holy place, and and the, the God's wrath was just poured out to, to you know, upon the world like 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 you see in the Book of Revelation. You don't. It just didn't happen. Only through real manipulation of the scriptures and manipulation of in your mind of what it actually says, then you can make it fit somehow. But that's not what it's, that's not what it says. Verse sixteen. Then, after when that man comes into the rebuilt temple, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Jesus is saying, "Look out! God's wrath is going to be poured out like like you never saw before. Look out!" The God of heaven will lash out. He will lash out like you've never, like the world has never seen. Verse seventeen: Let him who was on, let him who was on the housetop not go down to take out the things that are in his house. In other words, you don't have time. It is going to be serious, serious trouble. You don't have time to even go down in your house and get get stuff out to save it. Okay. Verse 18, let him who is in the field not return back to get his clothes. Forget about your clothes. Verse 19, but woe to those who are with child and to nursing mother and mothers in those days. You know, obvious for obvious reasons. Pray that your flight will not be in the winter, nor on Sabbath, Shabbat. Today, as we know, Saturday, the seventh day. For then there will be great suffering or oppression such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now nor ever will be. Again, to the preterists, this, is not, this did not happen in 70 AD. Yes, there was a war and yes, there was some, there was some buildings partially, you know, mostly destroyed. But it wasn't like this. It wasn't this, the wrath of God poured out upon the world such as has never been before. Think about what has been before. Sodom and Gomorrah, the, the flood. I mean, on and on it goes. You can look at other different times, uh, you know, when God, you know, just lashed out at hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people at a time, you know, in the days of David. Verse 22 Unless those days had been shortened, no flesh would have been saved. But for the sake of the chosen ones, those days will be shortened. In other words, it'll be so bad. It'll be so bad. Be it the rat, be it through just the wrath of God, through you know uh, natural disaster, or through you know work of God act of God, uh, or through nuclear war, whatever you want to say, whatever, however you want to interpret this, unless those days had been shortened. In other words, unless God, could, if he didn't come in and step, step in and say, enough, then everybody be done. Everybody be destroyed. No flesh would have been saved. 
but for the sake of the chosen ones, for the sake of those who are destined for heaven, destined as the, as, as the children of the Lamb. Those days will be shortened. Verse 23. Then if any man tells you, look, behold, behold means take notice, look at this. Look, here is the Christ. Here is the Messiah. Here is the anointed one. Or there. There he is over there. Oh, here he is over here. There he is over there. Don't believe it. Okay? So Jesus said, if anybody has to tell you that Jesus, that he come back already, it, it's false. Because when he comes back, you're going to know it. No one's going to have to tell you. No one's going to have to come on, you know, on, the, uh, on, on video or on radio or whatever and say, you know, the, Jesus came back. No. If someone, if someone said that, they are lying. It's, it's a false Christ. It's the Antichrist and the false prophet. Don't believe it, Jesus said. Verse 24, For there will arise false Christs and false prophets, and they will show great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the chosen ones. So this is how much, this is how convincing they'll be. Verse 25, Behold, I have told you beforehand. Listen, Jesus said, listen, I, I'm, I'm telling you ahead of time here. Take notice about this. I'm, I told you, I've told you about this. Okay. Verse 26. If therefore they, uh, they tell you, behold, he's in the wilderness. Go look, look over there. He's in the Sahara, he's in the Sahara, you know, desert or, 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 you know, he's in the wilderness over here. Don't go out. Don't go out to, to see what I, what's supposed to be me. Or look, he's in the he's in the inner rooms. He's over here in this in this conference center. He's over here in this in this uh, place over here. He's over here in this in this stadium in this uh, you know whatever. He's in the inner rooms. Don't believe it. For as the lightning flashes from the east as seen to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Okay, so. He makes it very clear here. Everybody, when he comes back, everybody will know it. You read it. Again, read it in the Old Testament, the so-called Old Testament scriptures. When the day of the Lord happens, the day of the Lord, speaking of the day when Jesus comes back to execute judgment upon the earth, it will be a day of great, terrible, uh, terrible, terrible, terrible display of God's wrath upon the entire world. People will be running under in caves to try to protect themselves from God's wrath. Verse 28. For where the carcass is, there the vultures will gather together. The eagles will gather together. Now we're going to come back to this verse. This verse is a little bit kind of in a, in a strange place here. But we're going to come back to this in just a few minutes. And I'm going to, I'm going to explain that to you. Verse 29, but immediately after, okay, after, A-F-T-E-R, after the suffering or the tribulation or the oppression, after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the, the stars uh, will, uh, will fall from the sky, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Again, stars f fall from the sky, that's figuratively... Um, that's a figure of speech that you won't be able to see them anymore. Okay, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. In other words, the powers of, um, uh, like the 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 planets. You won't be able to see the planets anymore. You won't be able to see. Uh, everything's going to be just basically more or less shaken. Verse. Um, Isaiah chapter thirteen, verse ten and thirty-four, verse four. It's got referenced here. And then, okay, then, okay, so after the tribulation, after it says in verse 29, after this, you know, we'll have signs in, in, the, in, the, in the heavens and the stars and the, in the sun and so on and so forth. Then, verse 30, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn 
Why? Because then they'll know that they've missed it all along and they know it's too late. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Okay? That is powerful. Power and great glory. Power and great glory. Glory here, speaking of just ex very extremely beautiful. Bright like the sun or even a million times brighter. But great, greater than that. <laughs> Power and great glory. Now, just so you understand, that particular in that that phrase, the sunny, the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory, that is taken right out of the book of Enoch. Yes, it is. Uh-huh. And we know the book of Enoch existed during Jesus' time. Jesus used a lot of terminology, a lot, a lot of phrase, phraseology, and a lot of theology from the book of Enoch. First of all, we know that it existed uh, you know, during the, the, the time of Christ. Uh, how do we know that? The Dead Sea Scrolls had the book of Enoch. Okay, Now, this is an interesting thing to know. Uh, before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, the book of Enoch, you know, you know the Christian world, uh, by and large, uh, taught that the book of Enoch was, not, was nothing but a forgery that was, that was forged around the you know, 2nd to 4th uh, century A.D., Okay, second, second to fourth century A.D. forgery. Um, that it was just forged after the fact. Okay, uh, and so that's what they taught, even in Bible schools. Okay, and then the Dead Sea Scrolls were found and dated the second to fourth century B.C. And the Book of Enoch was in there. Oh, whoops, whoops, whoops! We're out by about four to eight hundred years here by our. I, I, I'll tell you something, uh, not, are you, not only are you out for 800 years, but you are, again, uh, implying or insinuating that what was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls was the original copy of the Book of Enoch. It's not. It was a copy of the, of the original. So, uh, yeah, the copy was dated 400 BC. The original was obviously way back, way back, way a long time before that, okay? Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And Okay, this is uh, verse 30. And they will see the, the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Oh, yeah. Verse 31. He will send out his angels. Now, Jesus spoke about this many times throughout the scriptures. We read about it so many times so far in, in our previous sessions. He will send out his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, a shofar. It literally is what it says. And they will gather together his chosen ones from the four winds, from the north, south, east, and west, and from one end of the sky to the other. Okay, Verse 32, now uh, from the fig tree learn this parable. When its branch has now become tender and produces its leaves, you know that summer's near. Even so also, when you see all these things, know that he is near even at the doors. Most certainly, I tell you, this generation, word for generation, genea, also translates race. So this, this age, this race, this generation, uh, the human race, if you want to say it that way, will not pass away until all these things are accomplished. Verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. Speaking again about the physical material, the lower heaven, okay, the lower heaven. We're not, we're not talking about God's uh, heaven, okay, because there are three heavens, as we know of uh, later in Scripture. There are at least three heavens, if, more, if not more than that. Uh, so the lower heaven, that would be the universe as we know it, so to speak. The heaven and the earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Powerful, powerful, powerful. How can you say that? Because he is the living word. He is the living so-called Tanakh. Okay? He is the living Tanakh. And he speaks as the Tanakh speaks, the Torah, the Nevi'im, the prophets, the Ketuvim, the scriptures. Uh, it all says, you know, basically that, uh, that the word of God is forever, ever, forever. 
There's no seasons to the Word of God. It's forever. It doesn't change because God doesn't change. Verse 36, But no one knows that day and hour, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now the NU, the um, believed to be oldest manuscripts, adds, nor the Son. Okay? So no one knows that day and hour. Not even the angels of heaven. Now here's a verse it really astonishes me, even in even in my lifetime. And I know that way before I, you know, came into you know came into existence, um, way before my time, there's been many people who have been predicting the day, sometimes even the hour, the day when the Lord will come back. Uh, you know, Jesus is coming back on you know May twenty first. Oh, Jesus is coming back on September 23rd. Jesus is coming, or the rapture is coming, or you know, whatever. F nonsense. How can people say that in the face of this scripture? They have to be blind. They have to be blind. This is what this is what happens. This is what happens when you listen. And this is what it was, it was a gentleman there uh, several years ago that prophesied that Jesus would come back on a certain day. And, um, you know, his name was Harold. And, uh, after, of course, I put out a video before the fact. I said, listen, don't believe him. Jesus said it won't, no one's going to know the day or hour. And, of course, the day came and went, and Jesus didn't come back as he prophesied. And so um, I, I, uh, I put out a video saying that, uh, that, no, you know, don't believe this guy at all. And what happened? After the fact, after the day came and went, uh, he said, uh, Harold said, Oh, Jesus did come back. It's just that he came back spiritually. He came back spiritually. He came back, you know, uh, in the spiritual. It was a spiritual judgment upon this world. Really? What happened? That, uh, again, when you look at when people go to the extreme, when they're so desperate to claim that something happened spiritually uh, instead of really physically on the earth, um, as they claim to be, then you know it's it's just total nonsense. I mean, you know, that's a sure sign that that you got someone who is uh, completely trying to twist and manipulate the scripture um, to no end. You know, just totally butcher the scripture when they start saying, "Well, yeah, but it happened spiritually." Oh, yeah, but it happened, you know, figuratively speaking. Uh, sorry, I, I don't buy it. And, you know, it just didn't happen. Verse 37. As the days of Noah were, so will this coming of the Son of Man be. For, now this is what he's talking about, for as in those days which were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ship. So, in other words, the world just went on like it was like tomorrow. Like There's going to be a tomorrow. There is going to be a tomorrow. They went eating and drinking. They were just partying it up, marrying and giving in marriage. So they were planning their future, you know, planning their families, yada, 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 all the way until the day that Noah entered the ship. And they didn't know until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Okay? In the same way, people will be just living like is it just any other day, marrying, giving in marriage, planning as if Jesus is not going to, you know, the world is going still going to be here tomorrow. Um, they didn't know. Why? Why wouldn't they know? Because, again, you know, a lot of this teaching and a lot of this, uh, uh, this whole idea of eschatology and the, coming, the second coming of the Lord has been so distorted, so... <sighs> so re neglected anymore because of a, uh, the abuse of it but um uh, uh the church just doesn't say much about it anymore and so people don't think about it that much anymore uh so again it goes back to the church judgment begins on the house of god uh the church is responsible for what happens in the society around it the church is the light of the world if the world is dark whose fault is it verse 40 then two men will be in the field one will be taken and one will be left Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other will be left. 
Watch, therefore, for you don't know in what hour your Lord comes. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in, in what watch of the night the thief was coming, he would have watched and would, ha- and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, also be ready for in an hour that you don't expect, the Son of Man will come. So there's the promise. When is, when is the Son of Man coming? When you don't expect him to come. That's what he said. Are you expecting him to come? Well, he probably won't come then. He's coming in an hour that you don't expect. He's coming when you don't expect him. And again, the hour is not literally an hour. The hour is figuratively speaking as in the time. What day, week, year, you know, that he's coming. Um, uh He's coming in an hour that you don't really expect. Okay. Now, let's go back to this whole thing about two men in the field, verse 40. Uh, and one will be taken, the other left. Two women grinding at the mill, one will be taken, and the other left. Now, a lot of the evangelical church today uses these scriptures coupled with another scripture to fashion its doctrine of the rapture. So, Here we got Jesus talking about two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women grinding in the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Okay. Now, let's go on over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, if you're following with me in the Bible, make sure you keep your finger in, um, keep a bookmark there in um, Matthew chapter 24, because I'm coming right back to Matthew chapter 24 after I'm done here. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is another scripture that people use to couple with what, you know, they they basically, they merge it with this whole other um, thing that Jesus talked about. um, That two women will be in the field, one one will be taken, the other left. You know, two will be in in a bed, one will be taken, the other left. You know, uh, two will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, the other left. Uh, So it's like, taken? What do you mean, what are you talking about taken? Okay. Uh, So they... The modern day evangelical dispensationalism kind of doctrine church mixes those verses with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now let's look at it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15, down towards the end of the chapter. Verse 15 This, for this, this is Paul speaking now. Paul to the church in Thessalonica. For this we tell you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will in no way proceed, in other words, go before those who have fallen asleep, those who have died, okay? Fallen asleep in the scriptures many times speak of, uh, talks about death. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, mm-hmm. with the voice of an archangel and with God's shofar. God's trumpet. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will ever be with, so we will be with the Lord forever. Verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. Okay. Just to quickly go over this, since this is in the same context uh, as Matthew chapter 24. Uh, First point I want to point out here, and this is something I've never heard any preacher preach, but this is what it is. Paul says in verse 15, For this we tell you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will in no way precede those who have fallen asleep. We won't go before those who have died. Then he goes on to explain those who have died will rise first and go up first, then we will go. Okay, uh, verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, not quietly, not secretly, not sneak in and take his church, with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with God's trumpet. We know what it's like when God spoke normally, uh, when, you know, when Jesus was baptized, when, 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 uh, when Paul was knocked off his horse, you know, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased some people, you know, people heard it, you know, thundered, 
That's when God just spoke in a soft voice. What does it sound like when he shouts? It's not going to be quiet. Then the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will be with the Lord forever. Now, let me just point this out. This is just for this is just um, a little bonus here I want to add in here. Paul says we. Obviously, Paul thought that he would be alive when Jesus came back for the second time, the second coming of Christ. He thought he would be alive. Check it out again, verse 15. For this we tell you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive will be uh, who are left until the coming of the Lord will in no way proceed those who are fallen asleep. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with God's trumpet, that the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we, verse 17, we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord near. So we will be with the, with the Lord forever. Uh, just your own little, uh, just throw that in there as a bonus, okay? Paul thought he was going to be alive when this happened. Obviously, it didn't happen during his lifetime. So Paul was wrong here, okay? Let's be honest. Paul was wrong here. However, Paul is talking about when Jesus comes back, okay? Again, in context, you read about it in Isaiah, you read about it uh, in the book of Enoch, you read about it um, in uh, Zechariah, you read about it in Micah, you read about when Jesus, when Jesus comes back like this, with the, tr with the, with the sound of the shofar, he's coming back to stay, okay? He's coming back to stay, okay? So what does that mean then when Jesus said those who are in two in the field, one will be taken, the other left, two in the bed, one will be taken, one in the other left, two will be grinding at the millstone, one will be taken, the other left. It seems to be talking about the same thing, doesn't it? I'm here to tell you after going through a Bible prophecy course myself in the uh, early 90s and haven't studied this for all these many years, those 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 to 18, and the verses we just read in uh, Matthew chapter 24, verses 40 and 41, are not talking about the same event. Oh, oh, hold on a second. Listen to me, listen to me, hear me out. You know, the scriptures say, if fools answer before they hear. Okay, so hear me out first. Hear me out. Verse, uh, let's go again, keep your bookmark in uh, Matthew chapter 24. Let's go over to Luke chapter 17, because in Luke chapter 17, Luke records the same thing that Jesus said. About one will be taking the other left, one will be taking the other left, although he adds a little bit more insight into it. Okay? He adds a little bit more insight into it. Verse 34, Ma uh, Luke chapter 17, verse 34. Okay? We'll start in verse 34. I tell you, this is Jesus speaking, I tell you in that night there will be two people in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. Two will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. It says here, some Greek manuscripts add, two will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Now, here's something that Matthew didn't record. Verse 37 of Luke chapter 17. They answered answering, asked him, where, Lord? Good question. Where? He said to them, where the body is, there the vultures will be gathered together. There the eagles will be gathered together. Depends what, what version you're reading. Doesn't matter. The, uh, the meaning of the scripture here uh, is, remains the same. We're talking about a carcass. We're talking about a dead body. We're talking about death. One day, let me tell you a story. In the meantime, I'm going to go over to Isaiah chapter 57 to, to, uh, to solidify what I'm talking about here. 
I'm going to tell you a story. This is a, it's a, this is a true story. What happened to me? You know, years ago, I would like to listen to. Uh, you know, I still do, but years ago, I uh, had uh, a uh, audio Bible on audio, and I would listen to it every every um, opportunity that I had. And um, one day, I was in a parking lot of a grocery store, and um, I was in the I was in the parking lot, and I park I pulled up there, I parked there, and um, um, I was listening to the Bible audio Bible. Uh, the audio book of the Bible. I was playing Isaiah and it came to Isaiah chapter 57. And I was listening to it. And as I listened to it, sitting there in my vehicle, listening to this audio book, for the first time, bing, the lights went on. Boop. You know, and I, I, I realized more. I, I, I saw more than I ever saw before about what this scripture means. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 1. The righteous perish. The righteous people die. Okay? And no one lays it to heart. In other words, no one really thinks about it. No one understands. Merciful men are taken away. Good men are taken away. That term taken away stuck out to me. Taken away. And no one considers that the righteous is taken away from the evil. Verse 2, he enters into peace. They rest in their beds, each one who walks in his uprightness. Again, this is talking about death. The righteous perishes, verse 1. The righteous dies. Merciful men are taken away in death okay luke chapter 16 talks about the the poor man who was the angels came and took him away in death why people it says here in, in isaiah chapter 57 why do the, why does the good why does the righteous people die like that why do the, why do the good people die like that why does the merciful why why do they die like that why do they why why die like, why not live uh, so long why not live longer God says they're taken away from the evil to come. Taken away from the evil. This is what we're talking about. This is what Jesus is talking about in, in Matthew chapter 24, verses 40 and 41. This is what Jesus is talking about in, in uh, um, Luke chapter 17. Again, let's go back to Luke chapter 17, verse 34 to 35. Uh, excuse me, from 30, 34 all the way to 37. I will tell you, in that night there will be two people in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. Two, two will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. Like it says in some manuscripts, add two will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. And they answered him, where, Lord? And he said, and he said where the body is, where the, where the carcass is, there the, there, there the vultures will be gathered together. There the eagles will be gathered together. Again. Why did he say the carcass, the dead body? That why did why did why did he say that? That was just a figure of speech to make them understand that he was referring to death. Where were they taken? Death. They were taken by death, according to Isaiah chapter fifty-seven. Okay. So go all the way back to Matthew chapter twenty-four, verse forty. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two men will be two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Again, here taken is not talking about the pre-trib rapture. It's just not. And I know a lot, some of you will have a hard time with that because you always believe the first thing you hear is, and you never ever consider the fact that you may uh, perhaps even believe a lie. But some of you have. Some of you are not humble enough to admit it. You're not humble enough to listen. As I said before you comment, before you blow off your stack, listen, listen, hear me out here. Scriptures say, hear before you speak. 
It's, a fo it's foolishness. Only fools speak before they hear. You need to hear. You got to listen. So what 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is talking about, he's talking about after, like Jesus said, after the tribulation of these days. Certainly, the, certainly God's people will be protected through the tribulation, for sure, just as Noah was protected in the ark through, through the, the flood. But, you know, it's not a preacher of rapture where, someone come, where the Lord comes quietly to secretly just cause people to disappear like magic. That's nonsense. That's not in the scriptures at all. It's not in the scriptures at all. Really, it's not. Um, it is in the scriptures all the way from the Tanakh, all the way from the book of Enoch even, that, that the rapture will happen in a way when Jesus comes back with power and great glory. And the whole earth will see him at once. No one's going to have to say, oh, did you hear that Jesus came back? No, <laughs> I know. everybody's going to know. Everybody's going to know. So yeah, um, there you have it. Uh, the the pre-trib rapture is just a manipulation of these scriptures that just doesn't fit. It doesn't work. It doesn't make sense because it just isn't sense according to the scriptures. Okay. Verse uh, verse forty-five. Now we are at Matthew chapter twenty-four, verse forty-five. Matthew 24, verse 45. He, or who then is the faithful and wise servant? We all want to be wise, right? Whom his Lord has set over his household to give them their food in due season. You know, I'm praying that this session is food to you. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord finds doing so when he comes. Most certainly I tell you that he will set him over all that he has. It reminds me of people who say, oh, it's not for me to judge, only God judges. <laughs> if you read the scriptures, if you're really a believer, if you're really, if you're really a Christian, God gives judgment, the job to judge to his son Jesus, Yeshua. And Yeshua gives his judgments he gives the authority to judge to his 12 disciples. He told them, you know, we've read, we read this in, in past sessions. Check it out. Check out the past sessions. He, 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 uh, he told his disciples, his 12 disciples, you are each going to sit in the thrones of judgment over the 12 tribes of, of Israel. And later on, we're going to read how Paul confirms that every believer, true believer, I mean true believer, people who say, when I say true believer, I'm talking about people who really can say, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. I don't live by my own faith, my own lust, my own will, my own plans anymore. I don't live by my own desires anymore. The old is gone, completely gone. The sinful man is gone. The sinful passions are gone. The sinful habits are gone. They're dead. I don't live in them any longer, according to Romans chapter 6. But I live now a risen life with the risen Lord in holiness and in righteousness. True believers like that will be given the job to judge the world and the angels, it says. Paul said that very clearly to the church in Corinth. In Corinth. We're going to get to that. So, most certainly I tell you, Jesus said, he will set him over all that he has. Verse 48, but if that evil servant should say in his heart, my Lord is delaying his coming. Ah, Jesus is waiting. And begins to beat his fellow servants. Eat and drink with the drunkards. Do things that he shouldn't be doing. Again, eating and drinking with the drunkards. Um, I'm sorry, but fellowship with sinners is not allowed in the scriptures. That's why the Pharisees accused Jesus as being a friend of sinners when in fact he wasn't. He was, in, he was a friend of ex-sinners. He was a friend of people who wanted out of sin. As, as the doctor is a friend of people who want out of sickness, okay? Not people who love it, okay? The people who were the real sinners, according to Jesus, were the Pharisees. 
again, not all of them, but a good part of them. They were hypocrites. They were the, they were the real sinners. Was Jesus a friend of the, of the sinning hypocrite Pharisees? You tell me. The Lord of that servant will come in a day that he doesn't expect and in an hour when he doesn't know it and will cut him in pieces and appoint his portion with the hypocrites. That is where, there, where the weeping and grinding of teeth will be. Wow. Again, this is not your hippie, nice, loving, you know, love and grace kind of nicey, nicey, goody two-shoes Jesus is talking about. He's talking about cutting people into pieces. This is what it says here. If you're evil, hypocrites, okay? It's very, very important uh, to take the Word of God seriously and take, to take the Bible seriously. So that concludes our, our um, session on Matthew chapter 24. That does not conclude my teaching on the end times because we're going to talk about it again as we get to those scriptures later on in our readings. So stick in there, okay? Check in, check in. Check in every day for, for, for new teachings, new sessions. And uh, may God enlighten the eyes of your heart. May, he, may God give you the, the gift of humility so that you're humble enough, if you are one of these people who have believed something different to what the scriptures actually say, that you're humble enough to say, yeah, my favorite preachers on TV, my favorite pastor, my favorite thing that I held so dear was actually wrong. Be humble. You could be wrong. Thanks for watching. God bless you.